So, so Elizabeth, you talked to Kenny about we're going to get on myths and things of that nature. Yep. Okay, sweet. All right. <laughs> Hamburger. Okay, let's see here. Let me look at my notes. You All breathing? right, Elizabeth. Okay. Don't forget to breathe. Stretch. <clears throat> A E I O U and sometimes Y. <laughs> All right, you ready, Elizabeth? I am. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Hello, everyone. This is Chris and Lizzo. We are a brother sister team. And on behalf of the Charcot Marie Tooth Association, AKA CMTA, we are coming at you. Coming at you from coast to coast. I live in California and Chris still lives in Vermont. That is correct. And this is another fantastic episode of our famous podcast name, what, Lizzo? CMT for me. That's right, folks. CMT for me. This podcast is for you, a comprehensive podcast covering all aspects of CMT. We want to hear your stories, share your challenges, and more importantly, share your inspirational insights. And we will also try to cover research updates as best as possible, interviews with the CMTA community, and a number of branch leaders and the general public. So keep listening in. And Chris, did you know this is our eighth CMT for me podcast? It goes by really fast. Right? Well, I will just correct you there, Lizzo. It's our eighth recording. Right. This yes. is our eighth recording and we all haven't right. gone all out. Just, yeah. See, you know, I got to reel her in, so folks. Every, I got to right. reel her in, folks, every once in a while. Okay. But listen, I'm going to cut you off and I'm really excited to talk to our next guest about his life and his determination to dispel myths and misconceptions about CMT. Wow. But- before I introduce our next guest, I want to talk about myths. And here's a classic one. When I say I'm from Vermont, yep. people are like, ah, <laughs> there are more dairy cows than people in Vermont. <laughs> Is that true or false, Chris? Well, first, I sure hope they don't laugh like that because <laughs> that would be pretty scary. Um, but that is not true, Lizzo. What? Vermont has one cow for every 3.8 people, which is still the nation's highest ratio of cows to people. Hmm. What do you think? Okay. Let me throw some your way. Let's okay. go back and forth. Okay. The common cold is caused by cold temperatures. True or false, Lizzo? Well, I would say false, but Gilles would say true. Well, you know what? True is incorrect. The common cold is caused by germs, not cold temperature. Although cold temperatures may somewhat weaken your immune system. Mm, let's talk about hairless cats. Do the we have sphinx. to? Sphinx. Oh, oh you love them. Come on. Uh, okay. Okay. So here's a myth about hairless cats. The sphinxes. They're slimy and have absolutely no hair. True or false? False. I was yeah. at your place and they were adorable. They have a fine coat of hair like suede. That's right. And they're not slimy at all. Here we go, Alyssa. True or false? Your stomach muscles will cramp when you swim right after eating. You remember that? Well, this better be true because I hate to think I spent hours and hours just on the beach waiting to go into the water after lunch. Yeah. I remember our parents constantly. Nope. You can't go in the water <sighs> if you eat. You got to wait one or two hours. You're going to die out there. So I'll tell you, nope. It's not true. The body okay. does need extra blood to digest, but not enough to cause your cause your arms and legs to stop working. Yeah, that's kind of stupid anyway. Yep. Exactly. Oh, I eat a little bit and now my arms and legs aren't gonna work. Like who right, thought of totally. that? <laughs> hey, I have uh, another sorry. one just quickly. Okay. Does it take seven years to digest gum? Of course. I remember as a kid, every time chewing gum. Our parents yeah. would say, Hey, don't swallow that gum. It's seven years to digest if you're lucky. I bet like, where would it go? That is totally false. Your body yeah. can't even digest gum and it just goes right out. It just okay. goes right through you. Oh, perfect. Well, I swallow gum all the time. So that's, that's good. It's good. That it's not all good. building up in your stomach and you're going to create a blockage or exactly. bubbles in there. All right. So listen, we're going to move on, but just a few others. If you touch a toad, you'll get warts. True. It's safe to eat food that's been on the floor for five seconds or less, right? Not yeah, that's true. good to know. <laughs> exactly. Because I do all right, it all listen, the time. Enough, enough of these <laughs> myths. Let's talk to the let's talk to our guests. And you should do the intro, Lizzo. Go for it. Okay. 
I will go for the intro. So our next guest is my friend, Kenny B, otherwise known as Kenny Raymond. And he's on the CMTA advisory board. He's a moderator of the CMTA Facebook group. He does such a great job with that group um, with two other moderators. He has a blog, The Cryptid Sloth. I don't know what that means. I know what sloth love means, it. but we'll, we'll figure that out later. Yep. And he's a hardcore CMT researcher who's extremely knowledgeable about CMT and genetics CNT and everything really. He's just recently written a CMT subtype database and co authored a paper with Dr. Alsaic, a pulmonology specialist in at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles. He's wow. amazing. So, introducing you to Kenny Raymond. Hey, Kenny, glad to have you on this podcast, pal. Thanks for coming. What up? What up? How's everybody doing? <laughs> well, oh, we're God. doing much better now having you on. It was getting getting pretty ridiculous. There. It was getting really boring. Yeah, it was boring. It was I'm oh. like, oh, let's just get to the gas, man. Kenny B's in the house. We're going to change that now. I love <laughs> it. I love it, Kenny B. So Kenny B, let's start by learning just a little bit about yourself. You know, where you're from. Do you have CMT? Do you have family, et cetera? So give it a shot. What do you got to say? I have CMT1A. I was first diagnosed in 2002 when I was 29. Um, I was genetically confirmed to have 1A a year later. Um, at the time, I was living in northern Michigan in Traverse City, which if you hold up your palm of your right hand, Traverse City sits at your pinky. That's how you know you're from Michigan. You can hold up your hand and point <laughs> to where you live. Oh, that's cool. Didn't know that. Just well, so I'm you know, too, in... Elizabeth was having, uh, or excuse me, Lizzo <laughs> was having trouble finding her pinky. But anyways, <laughs> I got it. Slimy cat might have it. Eat, <laughs> eat more bananas. So, I'm in Detroit now, which is where I was born and raised, which again, if you hold up your hand, Detroit's at the base of the thumb. And the really cool thing about Detroit is it was first settled by the French. Woohoo! Ooh, I like that. Yeah, the city's over 300 years old. Wow. I didn't realize that. Hmm. Okay. And of course, it's the automotive capital of the world, but... Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> We're not here to talk about cars, right? Right. No. So, Kenny, so when, you, when uh, I was first diagnosed, oh, go ahead. Yep. When I was first diagnosed, I was quickly ushered to Dr. Shai's clinic down here mm. in Detroit. And he, together with his staff, um, primarily Shauna and Carly, are who piqued my interest in learning CMT to the depth that I have. Hmm. And they were very instrumental early on, especially since this was just at the very early days of the advent of the internet and helping me to navigate what was real information and what was misinformation. Cool. And they were able to, to get me to recognize how to dive in and dispel that misinformation. So that you come out on the other side with an ability to have as informed of a conversation with your doctors as what was possible so that you could work as a team to figure out how you're going to proceed with this crazy thing we call CMT. I'll tell you, that shy dude is unbelievable. He is, he is. Uh, very influential. He's done a lot of awesome things and uh, great, great guy. And, and Kenny, just... To go back in time a little bit, just to give the background of your story as we launch into myths, right? So tell us a little bit, right? You were diagnosed at 29. Uh, what was life like before that? Uh, when you were diagnosed, was it an emotional roller coaster, uh, you know, et cetera? So for me, my, my road trip to diagnosis isn't unlike many, probably most CMTers who are the first in their family to be diagnosed like I was. Although I was diagnosed at 29, I can't remember really when I wasn't battling CMT. Hmm. Um, my scoliosis and kyphosis started to kick in around 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember not feeling the pains of CMT. I always had coordination problems. I was never very athletic. Um, I've always had high arches. Uh, my legs have always bothered me. Um, I dislocated my knees a lot. Hmm. So that was fun. Um, and through, through everything and just trying to get the answer of why, 
what's going on because it, it was evident to me. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not like my peer group. Why? Why so was your mother? So Kenny, I'm sorry to, or I thought you were done. You, you no, paused, you took Be a ready, breath Kenny. and I thought you were done. Be ready, Kenny. Lizzo's <laughs> good at this. This is a talent. So <laughs> now I don't even remember what I was going to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You see, so we're talking about his mother. Right. Tell me so, about your mother. Right. Your mother. Your mother. Your mother. Um, so wait, she... I do have a question. No, mm -hmm. no, it's, you don't have the question yet. Hold on. So did she help you? Like, were you like up to 29 or 27? Were you going from doctor to doctor to doctor? And um, we was were... she bringing you there? And so, yeah, I'm sorry. I keep talking over no, you. Not, Go ahead. No, no, no. We, we were... Um... A lot as a kid in, in growing up, we went from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor, being told all kinds of things. She had a brother who we thought had muscular dystrophy, but since his death, learned that it was actually polio. Oh, at, wow. one, at one time, a couple times, actually, I was told I had muscular dystrophy, but they wouldn't go anywhere past that. Just deal with it. Um, I was told I had multiple sclerosis. I was told I had Friedreich's ataxia. Um, I think CIDP was, might have been one of them also, which is a common CMT misdiagnosis. Um, but with everything I had been told, there was really no treatments offered for any of it. It's like, here, this is what you have, go away. No, and I was even told I'm making all of it up because I wanted attention. Oh. Yeah, that sucks. I and, hate and that. Terrible. No, unfortunately, my mom died before I could get the diagnosis. Oh. Um, and she, she had always blamed herself for having smoked while she was pregnant with me. No, well, it turns out it's not the case. You know, I inherited it from my dad. Oh. Oh, you did inherit it from your dad. I did. I did. I was the first diagnosed in the family. Um, and then my dad, um, 60 years old at the time, was diagnosed, but not because he was symptomatic, but because he was willing to participate to see if there was any family history or if I was a de novo. And it huh. turns out he did have it. But dismissively mild. Nobody ever thought to question that he had any neuromuscular anything going on hmm. wow kenny your story is so common from a num number of individuals we've interviewed and that is uh you know they're not really sure what they have they're extremely frustrated they withdraw they don't want people to know that maybe they have some sort of disorder and they go through this for a period of time and then uh you know, it's interesting how people respond once they have that diagnosis to either frustrated or all of a sudden, you know, it sounds like I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in the, the lack of information in terms of that point, once you receive that diagnosis from shy, you really, uh, you know, involved yourself to learn as much about CMT as possible, hopefully to share that information with others. Yeah, exactly. Well, I wasn't diagnosed by Dr. Shy. Okay. Um, he, he's the one who got the genetic confirmation. Oh, all right. But um, prior to him, I was diagnosed by a guy named uh, Richard Ball in Traverse City. And it turned out I would learn he was a retired physiatrist from U of M who moved up to Traverse City and then got bored, went back into practice. Hmm. Huh. But he was one of the diagnostician pioneers in CMT, I would learn, with electrodiagnostics and CFT, which is how I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed by nerve conduction study. Okay. With, and and can you explain what a nerve conduction study, yeah, what does painful? it feel like? Yeah, sure. Sure. So um, for me, a nerve conduction study isn't painful, but we read, um, especially in the social media groups where it's exceptionally painful for many CMTers, but a, a nerve conduction study, which is often confused with an EMG, um, is where they essentially shock you and read what the nerve is doing. And it's a very low level shock, but it, I can imagine it would be uncomfortable for many. For me, they hit the button and a muscle jumps and I'm like, wow, okay, that just happened. Hmm. Um, running out of air. Oh, so let's oh, talk about your symptoms. Let's too. talk about yeah. your yeah. symptoms now, a little bit. And we yeah, can let, slow let, down. Me, let me finish the, the nerve conduction for a minute. We'll have to edit it out, but I need to cut my, I need to catch my breath for a second. Yeah. It's okay. No, no, Take no. your time. Um, I will say one thing is when you talk about the nerve conduction, all I'm thinking about is Jack Nicholson and one floor of the cuckoo's nest. And hopefully that's not what it is. No, it's a little, <laughs> little different, little different, but okay. that's a good, good. visual. <laughs> it is a good visual. But it is true. A lot of people I've had nerve conduction. They're not pleasant. 
They're just mm -hmm. not pleasant and they do shock you. And then your anxiety even makes the pain even worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what a nerve conduction study is, is they basically wrap a little electrode at the far end of a nerve. And then they measure up with a little tape measure and make a little mark with a pen because distance over time travel, uh, matters with a nerve conduction test. Hmm. And then at that mark where um, they made with the pen, they hit you with essentially a trigger. It's an electrode. And that trigger sends an electric signal through your skin down to the receiving electrode at the other end. And then a computer records the speed at which it traveled and the amplitude at which it conducted. And that what does the amplitude mean? Of the nerve conduction. Now, amplitude is how strong the signal is. Okay. So where the speed is velocity and is measured in meters per second, the amplitude is the strength of a signal and is measured in millivolts. And they also read the latency, which is how long did it take for the nerve to respond to the stimulant? And then so, another measure is called F wave, which is the length of time it took for the signal to travel the full length of the nerve. And where some of the confusion is with EMG, because it's more commonly known and it's a more commonly used diagnostic tool in general, it's sometimes done with a nerve conduction study, but not always. In an EMG, where it differs from a nerve conduction study, is that an EMG reads electrical activity within a muscle. And the EMG, for me, is extremely painful because they jab needles into a muscle and then tell you to move the muscle. Oh, yeah, I would imagine that's painful. So, yeah, it's fun. But altogether, it, just, it gives the doctor the overall picture of what the nerves are doing. And there's certain sets of parameters that fall within what's known as being consistent with CMT. I feel like I'm back in science class. I know. I should be taking notes here because it's like really interesting. And the I'm amplitude, afraid. Amplitude, millivolts. Shocks. Latency. 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 Don't, don't tell me what I come up with for F wave. Right. <laughs> or don't ask me what I've come up with. So you were talking about you don't have pain with a nerve conduction study, but you do with the EMG. But then when we were talking earlier, you know, I've, I talked to you quite often and something that really stood out for me and touched me was that you said you can never remember a day without pain. And can you just talk about that yeah. a little bit? Sure. So some people experience a lot of pain with CMT and others don't. We don't know why. For me, it's always been my lower legs that have hurt the most and they've always hurt for whatever reason. And that pain picture is part of what led to my diagnosis actually. But even when I was first diagnosed, I was told it doesn't cause pain until, you know, I, I met the doctors who know better, but the, the, the pain is real with CMT hmm. and the people who encounter the pain the pain itself can become debilitating and it can control every second of your life. I'm sure. And is, is that um, in terms of controlling every second of your life, does pain act that way with you? It used or, to, but it doesn't now. Okay. I don't necessarily know why it doesn't because my pain level hasn't changed. It, it does slow me down and there are days where I just can't so I don't right for the most part I just deal and I soldier through and I don't mean to sound arrogant if it comes across that way um, I was a victim of the overprescribing epidemic from the very outset I had become a pain patient um, in late 99 early 2000 which is right when we were starting to overprescribe everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. And very quickly, my pain management program escalated to all the opioids. And while I may not have necessarily exhibited addictive behaviors, I wasn't going out to rob somebody if I ran out of pain meds. I was right. absolutely addicted. Hmm. 
you, and, you had a physiologic dependence. I did, like and body. I know that now. Right. Yeah, we, we didn't know that then. Um, but we know that now. Dr. Day in the patient and family conference back in November gave an epic breakdown of how pain works in CMT and why it's so difficult to manage. It, it, it's everything I can picture in my head, but I hadn't been able to yet to really discuss it in such simple terms like what he did. Huh. And, and it's so what, an eye opener. I would imagine. So what are the alternatives, right? Cause the easy thing is to prescribe medication. And I just it, want it to say, Kenny, opioids don't really tackle nerve pain very well. It might make you feel like, you know, you're not so focused on it, but they're not the best remedy for nerve pain. And I learned that through my own physical pain and with Johan, because he's always suffered from chronic pain, but no one believed him. You should see a therapist, you know, is your mother influencing you? I mean, all these labels that people give and you just come out feeling defeated. Yeah, it, it, it's true. It, and it's unfortunate. And the, the overprescribing epidemic has really cost the people who need the therapy the most because now they can't get the support. They can't get the pain management because they walk in the door and they're automatically labeled as a pill popper. Hmm. Somebody who just wants drugs, somebody who just wants to get high and it's unfortunate and they're left behind. Yeah, I would imagine. And so how, how did you transition from that addiction? I simply had enough. So I stopped. I don't recommend oh, anybody do what I did. It, uh, it was late 2010. It may have been 2011. Okay. And I just had enough. And at the time I was taking a morphine continual release, a morphine immediate release, a methadone, a muscle relaxer. And I was up to 3,900 milligrams of gabapentin on my oh way to 4,300 milligrams as the target therapeutic goes. And I had enough, nothing was doing anything for me. And I was an absolute zombie. So I stopped. I just literally stopped. And for the next three weeks, it was an absolute hell I'm, going through I'm all sure. that withdrawal. Fortunately, I had a good support system in place. So I was able to make it through it. Kenny, I don't know how and you did that because I have a similar I story. I stopped, but then I went to the pain unit in Stanford so they could help me get off those drugs because it was mm -hmm. just horrible. It was yeah, the best I, thing I, ever, but yep. I was a I, wreck. I, I don't and, recommend anybody do it the way I did it. It was not safe. I, yeah, I and ended I'm, up in real trouble. Yeah, and I'm sure not everybody can say, I'm just going to stop. And it just made me think of a you know, for me, very minor story. I mean, I tore my ACL and I needed surgery. And then, you know, I forgot what pain medication it was, but after 10 days, I was like, enough's enough. Right. I just found like, I remember I went in my backyard to sit in a chair and my wife came out and I was totally asleep in the backyard in the chair, mm -hmm. just like immobile. And I was like, okay, I'm stopped. But that was only like a two week. I can't imagine for years on this, how someone, yeah. I give you a lot of credit to do that. And uh, well, thanks, I'm sure that's you. not easy, man. Yeah. Can you I talk used to, to drive mm -hmm. like that. Oh, I used to work yeah, like too. that. Yeah. Right. Wow. It's, it's crazy. And it yeah. was all legal. It was all legal. Well, thank you, God you're here today. Yeah, no, seriously, well, because that could have ended poorly. It could have ended way, way worse. Yeah. But, but since then, my average pain day now is no worse than what my average pain day was on all those chemicals. Have you learned coping mechanisms, Kenny, or do you just kind of deal with that? Man, like some people do meditation or active breathing or biofeedback. I just deal with it and I push through. I, I accept it as my normal. Um, that's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I accept it as my normal and I push through. Luckily, I have, you know, an amazing family at home that understands and gets it. So it's never an issue. No, I'm, I'm very fortunate because not everybody has that. No, his mind is made of steel. He has a yeah, steel exactly. mind. He just goes, moves exactly. forward. And, it's and those Kenny, banana I don't know peels. If, it's the banana peels. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kenny, you, uh, you do have children? I do. And how many uh, children do you have? Between my wife and I, we have five plus two grandkids. 
Okay. Boys, girls? Um, we have we have four girls and one boy. With uh, the, the youngest, um, our son, Stephen, is uh, 16. And yes, you and then, do feel bad for him. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. F amongst four dude. girls? <laughs> dude. <laughs> Jeez. None of them have CMT. Oh, that's unbelievable. None of them have CMT. Wow. So at least in my family, it stops with me. Okay. And so, so can, Kenny, oh, go ahead, Lizzo. No, I just was really wondering about his current symptoms. Like, that's you have exactly. CMT1A. Were you, you going to say it. the same thing, Chris? Yep, yeah, you nailed it. What are your current symptoms? Because you said, you know, you had a pause and usually breathing does not affect people with CMT1A, does it? Oh, it does. It definitely does. Um, but that doesn't mean it will. Because CMT and breathing, we we're starting to realize anecdotally anyway, that it affects CMT or can affect CMT across the board. Doesn't mean it will. And it doesn't seem to be relegated to any specific subtype. With my breathing, it sucks. There, there's no easy way to put it. It just, it sucks. Of everything that I do have to deal with, the breathing is what I hate the worst because it completely changes your life. The, the adage used to be CMT doesn't change your life. It does. Hmm. Sometimes it changes it in ways you're not prepared for. The breathing is one of them for me. You wear a CPAP at night, right? Or a BiPAP? I wear um, a non-invasive ventilator, which is a BiPAP on steroids, where CPAP is a single pressure and is designed to keep your airway open while you sleep. It just outputs a constant pressure. doesn't ever change. BiPAP is a dual pressure or bi-level pressure that is also designed to keep the airway open at night, but it has for exhaling, it'll drop the pressure down. So it's not as difficult to exhale against the pressure, which makes it more comfortable for a lot of people. But then um, what I have, a non-invasive ventilator, takes the benefits of a BiPAP for keeping airways open and then adds what's called a volume support. And a volume support is that the machine outputs with every breath a volume of air that's equal to the tidal volume of your lungs. And the tidal volume of oh. your lungs is the amount of air that your lungs have to move on one respiratory cycle to make sure all of your organs are staying oxygenated. And a respiratory cycle is one breath in, one breath out. The rule of thumb for males with tidal volume is 500 milliliters, and the rule of thumb for females is 400 milliliters. Hmm. And getting that consistent volume in addition to the pressure helps your lungs to more fully inflate with less work. So the muscles are getting a break. Okay. So you have breathing issues. Right. And mm -hmm. one, one comment on that, Lizzo, mm -hmm. is just listening to Kenny, I, I just feel so fortunate. And when you've talked about it, it can control your life. I have asthma that's totally controllable. Mm -hmm. But I remember growing up, I would always comment that is the worst thing when you're fighting to get air. Yep. And everywhere I went was, do I have my inhaler? Oh my God, I didn't forget my inhaler. What am I going to do? And you're like starting to panic because you want to avoid those episodes. Oh, absolutely. And I can't imagine, you know, uh, and I'm not saying that to relate to what you're going through, but it just made me think it must be, uh, I, I completely hear what you're saying and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Yeah, but you can relate to just from the asthma um, aspect. Um, our youngest has asthma. He has a, a pretty severe allergic react, uh, asthma. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's on injections for it. Mm -hmm. And when you have to fight for air and you can't get air, you know exactly what it's like. Yeah. And it doesn't matter at that point if it's asthma or if it's neuromuscular, um, neuromuscular related. Um, not being able to get air is not being able to get air. And it's scary. So it, it Chris, I've, scary. I've spoken yeah. to Kenny after like a thunderstorm or a really bad storm where all the electricity goes out. Yeah. So then he does, can't use his BiPAP or his non-invasive sure. NIV machine. And it's really, I mean, you've gone a couple of days without it, right? And you just have to stay up or you can't breathe. I mean, talk about scare. Yeah. 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 It, it's, I, now go ahead, Chris. 
No, I just said that's brutal. That's a brutal, yeah. brutal part of, of life in this situation. That's yeah. I'm, I make no bones about it. I have sleep yeah. anxiety. No, oh, I'm sure you do. If the lights go out in the middle of the night, I lose my machine. Right. Yeah. Every night I wake up because my machine has decided to go full pressure. And it does that when I stop breathing and it does that to keep me breathing and to wake me up hmm. without the machine. I, I wake up several times a night gasping in an absolute terror because I know I'd stop breathing. But this isn't the only symptom he has, Chris. He has many yeah, so more. This what is other like, symptoms, Kevin? Yeah. Well, as we've been talking now for a little bit, I'm losing my voice. I'm losing my vocal strength. And I if don't you know need how... to slow down and take a break, please let us know. So completely. Oh, yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. Okay. Um. And I'm starting to run out of air in the middle of sentences a little bit, which is all tied into the breathing issues. Hmm. Um, I walk on the sides of my feet. I have extremely high arches. I have really bad balance. Um, I have a really bad, well, not really a really bad, but I do have a kyphal scoliosis. Unfortunately, it's been stable since I was 17. I'm 48 now. I do still somehow have my hands probably because I was a guitar and bass player for so long. I do have my uh, hand issues. Handwriting is almost impossible because my hands cramp up, but I can still do thumb to fingertip on both hands. I'm starting to get my first contractures now on my right pinky. So just now starting to lose the hands. Okay. I have a constant fatigue, constant you know, muscle weakness in the legs. I have um, my hips wearing out. I say wearing out because it's kind of cute to say I have some torn soft tissue in one hip, which is fun. It's fun. So it's not be, fun. <laughs> because I didn't get into AFOs until I was in my mid thirties, my knees are wrecked, my hips are wrecked, and I'm feeling it in my lower back. So I think maybe your hips are wrecked and all is from walking differently, right? And the the pressure you put or the the continual wear and tear of walking differently on the sides mm -hmm. of your feet. And when I first met Kenny a couple of years ago, um, he's like, I'm not having surgery on my feet. I'm never having surgery on my feet. I'm never having surgery on my feet. Right. And now that's changed. Hmm. That has changed. And it, because it's had to change. I uh, I've been adamant from the word go. I'm not going to touch my feet and I'm not going to touch my feet. However, now I'm at the point where I don't have a choice. It, it's the only option. I have some torn tendons in one of my ankles and those torn tendons are the result of rolling my ankles so frequently. And the only option for fixing them now, because we've exhausted every option is surgery. Right. And because the only option is surgery to fix the tendons in order to ensure surgeries as success, we have to rebuild the foot because we have to change how the foot and ankle works. And you're looking at hip surgery too, right? And I'm looking at having to do hip surgery to fix the torn uh, labral that's in the hip. Wow. Chris, I think we need to go visit Kenny when he's out because he's going to be out like talking about all these surgeries I know. for the next two years. So. I know. And, and the other thing I was thinking about, uh, Kenny, when we did kind of our pre-interview, right? I'm thinking of your condition today, but I think you told me, hey, there were days you used to go out and ride 150 miles on a bike. Like it was nothing. Like it was nothing. Like it was nothing. So how does someone transition from, you know, being able to do those things to kind of where you are today. And one thing I don't think our listeners have picked up on, but Kenny is an extremely funny, humorous individual. When we did our pre-interview, I was laughing so hard. And uh, it gets into something about coping and things like that. I'm always curious about that transition. And just folks like yourself are so positive. And I'm always yeah. wondering, like, how the hell does that happen? If I don't laugh at myself, it'll consume me. Hmm. You got to laugh. You got to laugh. Making that transition. So I had my first knee surgery when I was 17. 
prior to that surgery, the day before that surgery, I could jump on my bike and ride 150 miles like it was nobody's business without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But that knee surgery, for whatever reason, changed everything. And coming out on the other side of it, it completely changed how my left leg worked. That's when I, I came out of that surgery and my left foot was flopping where it, it, it had never flopped before. In, in reflecting back, I remember being told that they had issues with bringing me out of anesthesia. Oh. Knowing what I know now about how I respond to anesthesia, especially with neuroblocking, neuromuscular blocking agents, such as succinylcholine, not to be confused with nerve blocks. I have to wonder, although I don't have any data to support it, I have to wonder if that was part of what ushered in the change, what made everything so differently. But even going from riding 150 miles a day like nothing to not being able to ride the bike down the street before I was done, at 17, the day before surgery, I had an honest 230 bowling average. 230? 230, honest average. Oh, my goodness. You ever seen Lizzo bowl? I have yeah, not. Yeah, 88. I, I think puts, I want to, though. That's with those, um, the gutters have the... Oh, that's with the bumpers. <laughs> with the bumpers, okay? So she's lucky if she breaks 50. But... Nice. That, that's me after <laughs> surgery. The, the, and I tell you what, it's like golfing, Right. <laughs> Last time I went golfing, I stroked an honest 85. Then they told me I had to play the second hole. <laughs> oh, nice. It's like downhill skiing, right? You right. go that way really fast. Something gets in your way turn. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Nothing to it. <laughs> Making the transition, though, I, I've always been one. Okay, this is what we're doing now. All right, then. Let's go. Yeah. You know, even when I was diagnosed, my diagnosing doctor told me, you know, you're not going to be able to do anything physical for the rest of your life. So get used to it now and decide what you want to do for work. I flipped him off to watch me. He was right, but still. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> that's, yeah, I mean, interesting, interesting story. And I, I was just thinking too, Lizzo, you, and we started this podcast with Miss. Yeah. And should we go down that path a little bit? Yeah, Maybe we, we can should. ask some questions of, uh, to Kenny there. Kenny loves um, talking with people that have been just diagnosed because there's so many questions and yeah. there aren't a lot of answers or there are too many answers and they're not accurate. And he just is so great on that Facebook group, answering all these genetic questions, telling you know, helping people read their genetic reports. And he does a lot of myth busting himself. And that's one of the reasons he has his website to dispel these myths. So something comes up over and over and over again on our social media group. And it's just like pulling my hair out and Kenny pulls his hair out. That's why he's like, you know, losing. Some that's yeah. Yeah. Well, he looks pretty good. Oh, he does. I didn't say that. He looks great, but. Um... Oh, I got the Chrome dome going. <laughs> yeah. I like it. <laughs> what is the difference or is it the same thing? Is Charcot Marie tooth or CMT a type of muscular dystrophy? MD? Dear God, no. What? <laughs> so dear God, no. What? No. no. All right. No. All right. We're getting that point across, folks. <laughs> no. CMT is not a type of MD. It's not a form of MD. They're, they're two completely different diseases, although they do have some common symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I think the root cause of that misconception is that the MDA provides patient services and research do uh, dollars for CMT. But even the MDA will tell you CMT is not MD. What's the difference? The, the difference is where the disease process lies. So in CMT, the disease process is in the peripheral nerves or the nerves that control the muscles. In muscular dystrophy, the disease process is in the muscles themselves. Where in CMT, the muscles waste as a consequence of the disease process in the nerves in muscular dystrophy, 
the muscle's waste as a consequence of the disease process that's in the muscles. Right. One's a but, muscle disease okay. and one starts in the nerves and affects the muscles. So the other one's a nerve disease. Right. Yeah. And we know this simply by looking at atrophy versus dystrophy. Just the basic medical definition of those two words. What are they? What is that? So atrophy, which is what CMT causes, is tissue wasting as the result of a disease process outside of the tissue. So when CMT, the nerves are diseased and the muscles waste because the nerves outside the muscles are the problem. So the type of wasting is an atrophy. Muscular dystrophy, which is why the name exists, dystrophy is wasting occurring because of a disease process in the tissue itself. So when the disease is in the muscles and the muscle is wasting as a consequence of that disease, it's a dystrophy, hence okay. muscular dystrophy. Right. Okay. The same thing could be said about a liver. If you have a diseased liver that's wasting, that wasting is a dystrophy because the disease is in the liver. Okay. Okay. So one other uh, comment, Kenny, is I've always heard, and you have to, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, an individual with CMT, uh, if their family members have CMT, they're all, they all experience the same symptoms. No, that is true not or true. False? Oh. Absolutely false. Absolutely one, one, false. One thing that, that has made CMT so difficult for scientists to fully understand is that it affects everybody differently even within the same family. And myself is a really good example. My dad was even at 60 years old, even when he died at 65, was so dismissively mild that nobody would have ever questioned he could have possibly had CMT. And hmm. then myself, conversely, I have what we know to be the typical high arches, hammer toes walking on the sides of my feet. Okay. Why is that, do you think? Why do people have such variabi variability? I, I wish I knew. Mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I honestly do. I, I can't put my finger on it. You know, there's Stop. just so much more to learn about yes. CMT. There, there is. We're I only, mean, there's so we're only much scratching more to learn. the surface. Yeah, unbelievable. I, I mean, it blows my mind. Right? You know, the, the, the name alone, CMT, are, represents the three fathers of modern day neurology, right? Basically three old dudes. But then, well, it's actually nothing, three dead dudes. Well, yeah, definitely dead. <laughs> <laughs> definitely dead. Been there. Good. Checked. Thanks They're for gone. that clarification, Lizzo. So if our listeners were thinking they'd reach out and talk to these dudes, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> I do have Ouija boards. We have several. I love Ouija boards. We, board. we have one we to close in the dark in case them. the lights go out. We got you. <laughs> love it. Who you want to call. <laughs> but they're... they're for everything that was learned in those first hundred years since the disease was first described by the three old dudes, we really didn't start learning anything until Dr. Shai and Lewis started their original clinic in Detroit around 1990. Wow. And everything we now know, we know because of the work they started, but it's only been 30 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We started the 1990s hoping, wanting to find a cause. And now we know there's causes in 120 genes. 120 genes. So does that mean there are 120 subtypes of CMT? 155 subtypes. What? 155 subtypes. Caused by mutations in 100 different, 120 different genes. And then another five chromosomal locations that are suspected of having a CMT causing mutation in a gene but the exact gene has not yet been identified. Wow. That's a lot. And well, so there's, the, there's a lot of research to be done. There is, there is, we're, we're only in its infancy. You know, the, the, um, Dr. Shai gave a talk a couple of years ago and in it, he said, scientists believe we're only about halfway to finding all genes. But if you listen to the podcast with Dr. Zuckner, he, he said something that caught me with Discoveries like the sword discovery and the sheer, I know, right? The sword. Sorry, on, on listeners, I'm waving my hand. On the guard. sword. 
with discoveries like that, and then the discovery potentially affecting so many CMTers, it could be likely that we're far further along than only halfway there. Hmm. Well, that's promising. Fingers crossed. Yeah. So anybody can do, if anybody can do it, Zuckner can. Yeah, he was awesome and that, very that dude, positive. That dude's he, a powerhouse. Holy he crap. made some great comments, I think, that in, uh, gave a lot of folks hope based on a few yep. sentences. Yep. So, Je um, what, what is your name again? Kenny. I was going to call you Jenny. B. Je <laughs> Jenny. I'm like, Kenny so B. Jenny. <laughs> what is your name again? 8675309. I don't get the reference. You turned me into a newt. <laughs> I got better. <laughs> You help a lot of people read their genetic report. And I don't want to get all into genetics because we could be here like all day long with yes. everything oh, you've done in genetics. I'm game. Let's roll. Yeah. <laughs> no, we'll get you back on for that, yeah, that right. session. But a lot of people think they have two, three, four different types of CMT when they try to interpret their genetic testing result. And something comes up like they don't have um, what exactly causes CMT, not what's pathogenic. Right? Is that what they say? It's not pathogenic, mm -hmm. yep. but it, there's a variant of uncertain or unknown significance. Does that mean that the variants they find in these genes is that a type of CMT? So if I have a variant in four genes, I have four types of CMT. Usually, no. I, I don't want to necessarily overstep and say no, because ultimately the doctor gets the final call on what the genetic test results mean for the individual. However, said that, saying that, often with genetic test results, they come back with a lot of different findings. And these VUSs that you mentioned, a variant of unknown or uncertain significance, are very common in genetic testing in general, but especially in CMT. And all a variant of unknown significance means is that we just don't know what the mutation means yet. It might cause something. It might not. It might be responsible for what you're dealing with. It might not be. There's not enough data yet. Dr. Zuckner made another point um, in his uh, podcast episode that CMT is caused by one mutation or somebody has a mutation in one gene. And that's significant because that kind of helps to clarify that although a genetic test may have identified mutations in six different genes that are associated with CMT, those mutations themselves might not be associated with CMT and they might not be causing anything. Yet at the same time, there are people who do have a legitimate more than one pathogenic mutation on their test report. So what does that mean? Do they have two different subtypes of CMT? They might, or does it actually constitute its own standalone subtype that we haven't named yet? At the end of the day, if the mutations are a cause of CMT, but it's CMT, and then scientists give the mutations a name, and that name is what we call the subtype. Okay. And so, I hope I didn't confuse you because I was starting con to confuse myself. Uh, I'm spot on, Lizzo. You I'm know, still grappling think, with all that. Dude, I, I still, lost track. <laughs> yeah, no, she's got it though. She's very, very smart. So, Kenny, um, I'm just thinking as we're getting towards the close of the podcast. Um, so, number one, Already? Lizzo. We just Lizzo got here. Dude, I know. You're killing Lizzo me, Smalls. Come on. We're not done yet. We're not done. <laughs> Lizzo referenced so your website. What is that website? So the website is something I started a couple years ago. Okay. Um, to host a blog, but also to provide just the most basic of CMT information that's otherwise really hard to find. What does the cryptid sloth mean? So the cryptid sloth, I needed a name. And I needed a name that wasn't taken. So a sloth has been my spirit animal for years. A sloth, sloth wants to be at its lowest energy state. I can identify with that because I don't want to move either. 
I'm all I'm uh, all about lowest energy state. Right. They're kind of they cute and cuddly too, aren't they? Oh, they really are. <laughs> how, how can anybody not like a sloth? I mean, come on, oh it's a sloth, goodness. right? It's a freaking sloth. They're adorable. But then cryptid, which is C R Y. I can't even spell it. Where'd I leave off? Cryptid? <laughs> C R Y P T I D. Does that sound correct? Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it wrote it down somewhere. So a cryptid is a mythical <laughs> creature that exists, but its existence has never been proven or disproven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Learning. So there Learning you go. Something new. So the sloth who exists, but its existence has never been proven or disproven. Okay, Kenny. There, there is. Uh, I'm just. There's a few things to say, and I'm sure Alyssa wants to say as well. But one thing we always do on this podcast with our guest is really ask them based on their experiences, right? Because I, I picture the listeners listening to this podcast, and it might be someone recently diagnosed with CMT or not diagnosed with CMT, uh, someone who might be struggling uh, emotionally, coming to grips with their CMT. So just on your experience, you know, words of advice. You know, words of wisdom. What would you What would you say to this this community here? So, when you're first diagnosed with CMT and you hear those words that nobody's ever heard before, it can be difficult because you're told, "Look, you have this disease. There's no cure. We really can't treat it. We can maybe manage the symptoms, but here you go, get out of here." And that's hmm. typically the the extent of what it is, and it's unfortunate. But how do you deal with hearing something like that? You have something you're born with, you're going to have it for the rest of your life, go away. It's difficult. The, the silver lining in it, at least for me, is, is that although the words are hard to hear and to digest, CMT itself is not anything new for anybody who's newly diagnosed. They've already been living it. Hmm unless they have an established family history, they've chased that diagnosis for years, sometimes decades. So while the name itself might be new, the disease itself isn't. They've already been dealing with it. They've already figured out how to work with it. They've already figured out how to survive with it. And thus far, everybody has survived their worst day ever. Hmm. What the diagnosis did for me was it provided answers to all the questions I already had. And then for many more questions, I didn't even know I had. Yeah. And I think you referenced very powerful prior was like something along the lines, like, Hey, don't stop pushing for answers. Right. They are there. Just they keep are there going They're There, right. You are not Never crazy. Keep stop. going. The right. answers are there. Even after your diagnosis, when everybody tells you CMT doesn't cause breathing issues, keep pushing for that answer. When you meet with a pulmonologist and they tell you, no, you're fine. If you still can't breathe, guess what? You're not fine. Keep pushing for those answers. They are there. Kenny, I really want to thank you for all your work Um with the CMT community in general. You're an amazing force um, within the community. And I know you're very, very appreciated by everyone at the CMTA and beyond. Definitely. So I met you give hours and hours and hours of your time. And uh, just on behalf of our board, on behalf of the community, Chris and myself, really thank you so much for everything that you do. Oh, you're more, more than welcome and thank you. For yeah, it's, a, it's an honor. Yeah. I am, I, I am grateful beyond words. I, I can't express how grateful I am for, for the for unending kindness and never-ending support. It, it's unreal. So if somebody wanted to uh, get to your website or your blog or reach out to you, how do they do that? Well, the website is thecryptedsloth.com, mm -hmm. C-R-Y-P-T-I-D, sloth.com, not cryptic, but cryptid. Um. There you'll find the blog, you'll find the database that was used to generate the genes guide that you mentioned earlier. Find me on Facebook. I'm all over the CMT groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. All you over. Never all hesitate over. 
never hesitate to shoot me a message through Facebook. Yeah. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a C, I'm a CMT open book. I'll answer any CMT or that has a question or a concern. Well, that's awesome, Kenny. That's great. And to our listeners, here you have it. Here you have an individual diagnosed with CMT at the age of 29. And as a result of his experiences has totally committed his entire life to learning everything he can about CMT. So if you have questions, track him down. He's a wealth of information and just does an incredible, incredible job. And Kenny, right on, just, uh, sorry, I'm hesitating because I get a little emotional, but uh, really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you so much for having me on, man. You got it. Yeah, thank you, Kenny. I mean, you just go through so much and you still have that positive energy. And I laugh every day because of your comments in that group and you just just are just so funny. Good. So I love the bananas. Up. Love the bananas, bananas man. Bananas, bananas. You got to have your bananas. Yeah. <laughs> People tell me, how is it you're not a doctor? Yeah. Right? Like, I could so be a doctor. I, I could do this, right? Well, be and like, for oh, our man, list, you, yes. Be like, yeah, man, you got ghosts in your blood. Right. Should and for our listeners, Right. Kenny had said before, uh, people had asked him, hey, you know, you should go be a doctor. And he said, and this is out there for anyone who wants to donate. Hey, if you pay for his tuition, he will go. So keep that in mind, folks. Make it happen. Make, Make it happen. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Kenny. Thanks so much. And thanks for being part of our podcast. Thanks for having me on. It's been my pleasure. Awesome. And Lizzo, did you know that the National Organization for Rare Disorders will be sharing our podcast on Twitter and also in their upcoming, excuse me, blah, 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 upcoming <laughs> news blast. Isn't that really? Cool? Is that Nord? Nord. Wow. I didn't know that. That's Dude. awesome. All right. Dude, it is. Not to be confused with NORAD. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it's so cool, right? It's obviously gives me a great feeling on this podcast that uh, folks are listening and uh, we get great feedback and we have a whole list of individuals to interview. So more to come. So Lizzo, if someone wants to learn more about CMT, where do they go, girl? Well, they go to www.cmtausa.org. And as I said, if you want to pay for Kenny's tuition to be a doctor and or you would just like to donate to help us find a cure for CMT, where do you go, Lizzo? www.cmtausa.org. Awesome. And so to our listeners, do you have a good story? Would you like to be an upcoming guest on our podcast? CMT for me, I was going to say cycle for CMT. Yes. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to tell your story on our CMT for me podcast? Write to us info at cmtausa.org and pitch your idea. We want to hear from you. We sure do. So, okay, Lizzo, until next time, folks, later. Stay positive, everyone. May the force be with you. Right back at you, bro. That's it. That's it. Wow. Okay, I'm going to stop it, the recording. Stop. Yeah, sweet. That was a quick hour. I know. I mean, you could keep going uh, and we could continue.